Welcome to Sir Henry Fraser, His Life in Focus. I'm Miles Eversley. Thanks for joining us. In our last episode, Sir Henry discussed the Barbados Carolina connection. That discussion takes us directly into this week's episode. So the Barbados Carolina connection is a fantastic example of an opportunity based on a very, very rich history. And people both here and in America are totally fascinated when they develop that history. So I have to ask why we are sitting on it. Even if we could come to an arrangement where we have a travel agent who organizes the trips to and fro Charleston and a partner travel agent in Charleston so that we could commission one of the airlines to have a once a week flight from Charleston to take people from here to Charleston and from Charleston to here and back. This would be a fantastic way of boosting Barbados and increasing our tourism. And I'm sure that in a very short time with adequate marketing, with today's World Wide Web and all of the social media, we would have that weekly plane absolutely full and we'd have people queuing to get on it. There is no question in my mind. It is a no-brainer. It is marketing, 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 marketing. And the marketing today is largely cheap with the social media. I admit I don't use it, so I wouldn't be using it myself, but you guys will all be using it and simply spreading the word. I mean, I know that what I have done on television, I know that my books have spread the word to some extent, and we've given the opportunity to our government, to our tourism. So our, I hope that our tourism will recognize that heritage tourism is the fastest growing aspect of tourism in the world. We have all those millions of people flying out of Japan and China to visit the Western world, which they've heard so much about. And we have those millions of people in the Western world who are at retirement age and who, because of skin cancer, no longer would even consider lying on the beach. They want to sit on their balcony and admire the waves and maybe see a tropical bird that they've never seen before in the gardens of the hotel or the villa. But our visitors today want to do something interesting. They want to see something. And so heritage tourism is the platform, the plank, the theme that we should be developing. Now, we have all these historic sites in Barbados. St. Nicholas Abbey has done its own thing without any help from government. And they, they obviously have the advantage that Mr. Warren saw the opportunity of St. Nicholas Abbey, which Colonel Cave saw 40 years ago. But there are many other sites like that which can be developed. People, for example, who are Quakers. There are many millions of Quakers still in the USA. They all left Barbados because they felt persecuted, but they used to be wealthy Quakers in Barbados. And there is a Quaker cemetery, a burial site in St. Philip, near St. Philip's Church, discovered and restored and cleaned up and run by Mrs. Monica Newlands in St. Philip. Quakers would come to see that if it were marketed. There are all the forts in Bob that were in Barbados, and they've all gone except for the one at the Hilton. There's remnants of forts at Holton and St. James at the police station. But the Hilton Fort is a magnificent part of the Hilton, and it inspired the early architects who designed and had built our historic Hilton Hotel that opened for independence in 1966. The fort at the Hilton used to be very much used by the hotel. I don't know if it still is. But when I have taken tours, or done tours with the garrison, with Peter Stevens or James Blades, and we've gone as part of that tour to the Hilton Fort, it is one of the most fascinating places for the people coming to Barbados, because most of them have never seen a fort before. And to stand by a cannon and have their photograph taken by a cannon uh, is just one of those magical things that visitors like to do. And there are so many sites in Barbados that are worth visiting. Most Barbadians haven't got a clue that we have 20 museums in Barbados. Now, we can start with the Concord Museum up by the airport, and we can come down Hastings to the Malaloo Motor Museum, which is a magnificent museum. And then we go to the George Washington Muse House Museum at the garrison. And across the garrison 
is the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. And then we, we go into Bridgetown, where we, we find the Museum of Parliament and National Heroes. And we find the Nidhe Israel Synagogue Museum. And we find the Cricket Legends Museum. And we can go on and on and on, all the way down through St. James to Arlington House and down to the museum at Spring Vale. And then we come over to Sunbury Museum and Gun Hill Museum. There are 20 of these museums, the newest of which is the Exchange next to the Central Bank. And the vision of the Central Bank leadership in buying the old uh, Masonic Lodge there and creating the Exchange Museum is to be congratulated. So we have these magnificent museums which are simply not marketed. We tell the Ministry of Tourism about them, they don't appear on the website so that the people who create museums create them out of love and passion and sometimes they lose money on them because they're not marketed as part of our tourism. I think this is terribly, terribly sad and I hope that the heritage tourism that is a low-hanging fruit at Glendary Prison will become a reality very soon and I certainly hope that the Concord Museum will reopen in smart time as our tourism comes back, the Concord should be reopened. People do not appreciate what a magnificent plane the Concord was and what a tribute to Barbados it was that Concords flew to Barbados as one of their regular destinations. New York, Concord to Barbados, and sometimes Orlando, and a couple of other places intermittently. But Barbados was a regular flight for years and all of the wealthy people coming to the villas in St. James, which have made so much money for Barbados and so much fame for Barbados, most of them flew on Concord. So when Concord, unfortunately, took, I think, the bad decision to shut down their flights, and they brought the first plane that flew into Barbados to fly the Queen out of Barbados many years ago, that is the very plane on the anniversary of that date which is our Concord at Siebel. And very few Barbadians are aware of that. I found the Concord Museum to be an absolutely fascinating visit. I went there twice with friends and family. I have no great interest in planes, but I thought it was an amazing visit. I've also had a tourism function that I went to there, and it was really ideal for having a big function, whether it's a banquet or a ball or whatever. So I am sad that the Concord Museum has closed. I suppose part of the fact that it may have become run down, I don't know, and it certainly would be closed for COVID. Now we're having our visitors back. I'm told that 10 to 20 flights, jets, big passenger jets are coming in every Saturday and Sunday to the airport, and the tourists are everywhere. They should be going to Concord. And what they should do is to have a ferry service to see the Concorde for all of those who have a stayover period at the airport of more than three hours so that they can do a 40-minute visit to the Concorde Museum. It would be wonderful for Concorde. It would be a win-win for everybody. So the last heritage site that is worth mentioning is the Slave Hospital at the Blackman's Plantation site, which is now the Sir Grantley Adams Secondary School. Now, the Blackman's Plantation in St. Joseph, on the top of the mountains of St. Joseph, at nearly a thousand feet, that is one of the prosperous, successful plantations in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th century. And I have identified a building at the site of the old plantation great house, the center of the plantation, as it were, on the top of the hill, at almost the highest point on the property, which is part of the current school grounds. This is a building that was obviously built as a slave hospital. You see, in the old days, when slaves were regarded as property, the plantations were visited by a doctor either once or twice a week on a fixed income, so that some doctors may have had two or three plantations where they visited and they saw the patients who were in the sick house. So there would be a building where the patients, the slaves, who just were too sick to work, were put into this rather horrible little sick house, just a, a place with a roof very cheaply put together, no doubt, not built on the lines of a hospital at all. 
But when it was realised that the abolitionists were, success, were going to be successful in bring an end to the slave trade, the Barbadians in particular, who had always had, uh, a, shall we say, a better uh, outcome in terms of mortality than most Caribbean countries, and by the 1780s were reproducing rather than losing uh, net numbers of slaves, all over the Caribbean, the planters began to take the advice of the doctors to build proper hospitals. And these hospitals were built in the 1780s in particular, after the abolitionists made it clear they were going to stop at nothing to abolish the trade. Very big hospitals were built in Jamaica, the ruins of which still stand. But in Barbados, visiting plantation sites and plantation yards, I can only find one building which perfectly fits the description of a hospital. It's a long, narrow building with a central two-story portion at the Grant Lee Adams School site. And the building was built according to the designs that the doctors recommended. Huge windows, very airy rooms, separate compartments for the men and the women. So that this slave hospital that I have identified has the central two-story building about 16 feet square with an upper level, which would have been the, the nursing station, the management site. And on either side to east and west are long wings about 30 feet wide and about 15 feet, 30 feet long and 15 feet wide, which would accommodate two rows of beds uh, on either side so that each of these wings would have held about 10 patients with room for the nurse to move between the beds. Now, we have in Barbados an official UNESCO slave route. And that slave route organized by the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, that slave route takes people to the very first slave village established by the owner of Golden Ridge Plantation in the 1780s. He happened to have a mistress and five children. And so he assigned 22 acres of the village as a village below the cliff at Golden Ridge for his five children and his slave mistress. She was to get two acres and each of the five children four. And that village of 22 acres was known as Sweet Bottom. Now, some years ago, the government of Barbados, around 1980, 84, I'm not sure the exact year, decided that Sweet Bottom was a, a risque name. And they didn't like the idea of people talking about Sweet Bottom in Barbados they thought that there was something very wrong with that. So they decided to call it Sweet Vale, and nothing could be more English than Sweet Vale. <laughs> what they didn't realize is that there are hundreds of villages all across Britain, especially in the Cotswolds, which have the name Bottom attached to them. You know, it might be Primrose on the Bottom or Stow in the Bottom, and the name Bottom persists in Britain, but it's not allowed in Barbados. Most of us who are over the age of 25 still refer to it as Sweet Bottom Village. So the point I'm making is that the UNESCO slave route is a route that takes people from the museum to the Newton Burial Ground where they see a sign saying this is the site of the Newton Burial Ground and someone will tell the history of how the archaeologist and professor in North Carolina, Jerome, Professor Jerome Handler, how he did research there and he showed that the bones of the slaves were so high in lead that it showed that the bones of the slaves that he sampled were the bones of people who had a great deal of rum because in the old days every big plantation distilled its own rum through lead pipes and the alcohol absorbs the rum so that people absorb the lead and that of course made people sleepy lethargic lazy and gave them what they call the dry belly ache or colic because the lead produced constipation and gripes and the gripes, not associated with diarrhea, were therefore known as the dry belly ache, gripes with no diarrhea. And so that story will be told, I hope with the medical side of it as well, where you see the sign that says, Newton's slave burial ground. And then they go to Sweet Bottom where they see a sign saying, early slave village, 1780, where the owner of Golden Ridge created this village. And then where else do they go? to the modern monument at Rock Hall, which was established long after slavery, through the land being bought to satisfy the will of the slaves at the plantation 
which had murdered the old man who left this money to the slaves. And so those are the three sites, a modern sculpture and two signages. And that's the slave group site. So I am saying to the government, and I've said this to every successive Prime Minister and Minister of Education, that the slave hospital at the Gradley Adams Secondary School is the best example we have of a genuine slave artifact. And it can be used to produce a minor slave museum, or it can be used as the art teachers want, as an art studio, if it is restored. It will cost at least half a million dollars to restore it. But again, I believe that the Grant the Adams School's alumni must include people who are in the building trade and that they could find builders and merchants who would give them the materials that their builders could build it at cost or even pro bono. I believe that that is the way things can be done in Barbados, have been done in the past and should be done in the future. I have suggested a pro bono where the school sets about to raise half the money and the government gives half the money. That's how the General Hospital was built in 1841. Private sector and government, 50-50. So it's a very, very good way of doing things. Plans to restore this historic site were revealed during the launch of the repurposing of the old slave hospital project at the Grantley Adams Memorial School. CBC's Newsnight carried the story. The students at the Granny Adams Memorial and the residents of the parish of St. Joseph, by extension, will in short order benefit from the soon-to-be-restored Blackman Slave Hospital. The works for the buildings situated on the compound of the Granny Adams Memorial School are estimated to cost at least hundreds of thousands of dollars. Parliamentary Representative for St. Joseph, Dale Marshall, supports the move. As he notes, it will enhance community tourism and the parish's story. I very much laud this facility. I really hope to be around um, when it is finished. I hope it is finished very soon. Um, but whenever it is finished, it will be here for many, many more generations. And if there's anything that we can bequeath to those Barbadians who come after us, is that we leave them lasting mementos which speak of the dreadful parts of our history but which demonstrate that history and progress need not be in conflict. Now, several partners, including historic building specialist M. Womersley from the United Kingdom, are on board for the venture. And director Mark Womersley has been ensuring young Barbadian skilled workers learn the art of restoration. This is the end of a, a session working with tutors and students from uh, S. Samuel Jackman Prescott Institute of Technology uh, with um, the students from Grantley Adams and from the Barbados Vocational Training Board to help develop their skills so that they can work on older buildings, so they, they can understand how older buildings were put together, the masonry techniques, the mortars that were used in their construction, the plasters that were used to, to, to decorate the walls, the joinery work, how sash windows were put together, how some traditional joinery techniques you have here were used. So we, 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 when, I, when I arrived we asked them what they wanted to learn, what they wanted skills they wanted to develop further and we tried to work with them to do that. And so we witnessed progress in our efforts to maintain our rich history and heritage for the benefit of all Barbadians. Sir Henry was eventually called to serve his country at a higher level. I must say that the many calls, congratulations and good wishes of the past few weeks have persuaded me that appointment as a senator in this honorable chamber and in these hallowed walls must be the greatest honor and the greatest privilege that any citizen of Barbados can ever receive. But great honor and great privilege carry great responsibility. And as a humble son of the soil of the Republic of St. John, <laughs> in this our paradise of Barbados, raised by parents who were model public servants with the abiding principle that to serve is to love and to love is to serve. I hope and pray that I can do my part and serve the country 
and I'm equal to the task. The task of speaking both from the head and from the heart, of not being afraid of the truth, and to hope always to support the boldness, if I may say, of my visions with the strength of my evidence for that vision and to hope always to balance my love and obligations to God and country and people with my love and obligations to my own Minister of Housing, my strength in good times and bad times, and I mean my wife of 42 years, <laughs> Dr. Maureen Skeet Fraser. Now, because of my work in heritage tourism as well as medicine, the Governor General, Sir Elliot Belgrave, decided that he wanted me to be a senator. When he called me, I wondered what I had done wrong, but I went to see him and he said he wanted me to be a senator and he wanted me to represent the areas of both medicine and healthcare, medical research, the things that I was known for, as well as heritage tourism, which I had developed such a strong interest in. So it was a great honor and a privilege to serve in the Senate because it gave me an opportunity to talk about things that needed action, you see. Now, when I joined the Senate, it was a privilege because I was sitting with some really distinguished, eminent men. One of my great friends was Orlando Marvel. He was a Barbados scholar who had become a teacher, university lecturer, and then a diplomat. And he was a really brilliant man and a very sage, thoughtful person with a, an accurate opinion on many things. And next to him was Sir Geoffrey Cave, who represented business. We had a, another friend, Francis Chandler, who was a great agronomist and agricultural researcher. And these were people who knew what to say about important things and how to say it because they didn't speak for any half an hour because that was the opportunity you had. They spoke for five minutes, seven minutes maximum. They got the point across. It was not their intention simply to speak to hear the sound of their voice. Next to them was Sir Roy Trotman and the Dean Emeritus, Harold Critchlow, the Reverend Harold Critchlow. These were all magnificent independent senators that I worked with because as an academic, I've always been independent of politics, advising every government in a whole multitude of committees and so on in different ministries from education through to tourism. So the Senate was a great privilege. It gave me an opportunity of speaking. And I often felt, perhaps uh, unjustifiably, that people heard what was said in the Senate. But I realized that an awful lot of what was said in the Senate was waffle. And therefore, even though Senate debates were broadcast on CBC radio on the days of the Senate meeting, an awful lot of people didn't listen to them. I got a lot of comment when I walked down Broad Street or when I went to the beach. Lots of people commented that they'd heard what I'd said. But that wasn't, I think, a general rule. I don't think the Senate had the influence that it might have had. A lot of senators were people who had been politically appointed so that by public exposure, they may have an opportunity of influencing people and electing them at the next election. We saw that didn't, that didn't actually work very successfully. In my second term in the Senate, uh, the independent senators were added to by people like Lady Haynes, Dr. Carol Jacobs, Mr. John Workman, and Sir Trevor Carmichael. And these were all, again, very influential, significant people who spoke well. Alwyn Adams, who I agreed with very much on many of the educational points as the past headmaster of the College of Parry, points that he made were, were very, very valid and we were often on the same page. But I was disappointed in the general level of debate in the Senate. I have to say, I was expecting that there would be a level of debate that would be, if you like, above the soapbox and the platform used in political elections. Though Sir Henry found the level of debate in the Senate disappointing, we cannot discount our Senator's invaluable contribution to national development. This has been Sir Henry Fraser, His Life in Focus. I'm Miles Eversley. The series continues next week at the same time.